Okay, it's uh, two o'clock. Uh, let's uh, let's begin. Uh, welcome to Seeking More Salvation: Colon Religious Communities, uh, a program in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book, a project of Virginia Virginia Humanities. Um, I'm Joseph Davis, a research professor of sociology and director of the Picturing the Human Colloquy here at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture, uh, which is a research center within the University of Virginia. And we're very pleased to be hosting this event today. If you haven't read today's books, we hope you will, for details about how to buy them from our bookseller for the, this event, which is the UVA Bookstore, please visit vabook.org, vabook.org, where you can also explore our full schedule and watch past events. And since this is the last day of the festival, it's all, you'll we'll be able to just watch past events. Uh, while you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give, vabook.org slash give. All right, now I'm pleased to introduce our speakers, our authors, uh, Tony Ritt Lynn, author of Prosperity Gospel Latinos and Their American Dream, is a sociologist and program director for the Leadership Development Initiative at Trinity Church Wall Street in New York City. Previously, and for a long time, he was a research scholar here at the Adva Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture. Those are kind of welcome back from New York. <laughs> uh, and then Todney Thomas, author of Kincraft, The Making of Black Evangelical Sociality, is an anthropologist and assistant professor of African-American religions at the Harvard Divinity School. Her work examines the racial, familial, and spatial dynamics of Black Christian communities in the United States. Both our speakers are UVA, uh, got their doctorates here at UVA, one in sociology, of course, Tony, and then Tony in anthropology. So welcome to you both. Um, we're really looking forward to, to today's uh, webinar. Um, yeah, thank you. In, uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, now, in terms of format, given that we have two authors, um, I thought the best way to proceed would be for me to ask each a series of questions um, that are aimed to kind of draw out a little about each of their books uh, and the contribution that they're making. Um, and then when this part is finished, that is the, the kind of Q&A between me and them, um, I'll then have an open Q&A session. Um, so if you wanna put your questions in the chat um, uh, section of Zoom, uh, then during the QA, I'll, I'll try to ask as many of those questions as I can in the available time. Uh, and then, of course, we'll end at three o'clock. Okay, so that's clear enough for everybody, including our speakers. All right. Sounds good. Uh, Todney, um, maybe you could start with giving us a little overview of kincraft, um, including telling us what I don't think most of us are familiar with the term kincraft, although I, I suppose we can kind of intuit some meaning from it. Uh, and then kind of the, what the question was that you were seeking to answer um, with your research. And then, then when Tadi's finished, then I'll turn it over to Tony. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. It's nice to sort of e-meet you both, um, you know, to meet other UVA community members, um, you know, uh, and so I'm really thrilled to be here. And I remember the Virginia Festival of the Book being one of the highlights of being a grad student at UVA, so I'm really really honored and excited to be here. I also think that some of the UVA Anthro community um, that I'm a part of is, is online. And so I wanna say okay. hi to everyone, including my grad advisor, Susan McKinnon, um, who I think is also uh, a part of the webinar. Uh, so um, Kincraft and Making a Black Evangelical Sociality um, came out of um, really me being trained as an anthropologist of kinship studies. I was really interested in the ways in which um, Afro-Caribbean communities um, made sort of familial social networks. Um, and uh, one of the ways in which um, I ended up um, beginning to explore that was to look at how um, kinship became an operative language of community life um, in religious communities. Uh, so I was in Atlanta doing field work. I had a really difficult time trying to find an institutional basis for my work and my grad advisor Susan McKinnon asked, what about churches, right? Originally, I was uh, a scholar of kinship studies exclusively. And so religion came 
later. The ironic thing being that I'm at a divinity school and, and I my work has been most readily embraced really by religious studies. So part of the, 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 the process of Kingcraft was um, interest and question, but also a bit of serendipity and, and some of the exigencies of, of context. Um, by Kingcraft, um, I speak to uh, sort of two origins um, for Black evangelical relationship making. Um, the first is religious, right? Um, I think about uh, evangelical theologies, about being part of the universal body of Christ. Um, and in particular, this evangelical story is impacted by Plymouth Brethrenism, which is a 19th century evangelical movement uh, that begins in Ireland that's very strictly anti-sectarian, very anti-denominational, um, grows out of the disestablishmentarianism um, of the 19th century context, and really focuses on New Testament family churches, house churches as the authentic language for religious community. Within that kinship becomes operative, right? It's the alternative to denominational um, uh, sectarian language, right? So uh, part of the provenance of, of this, uh, of Kincraft comes from an evangelical imaginary that's very much invested in a kinship as an authentically biblical reference point for making uh, Christian community, right? Uh, and so uh, people understand themselves as brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and that um, I think is part of a Plymouth Brethren story. But I also think we see this in a number of evangelical communities uh, across the board, right? Um, it's really that we tend to think about such kinship claims as fictive that has really kept us from understanding how people create um, kinship language and understand what kinship means in religious terms. The second basis for kincraft is really an African diasporic story, the African diaspora, right? The, the deep histories of displacement, um, of ongoing migration, of kin making in um, difficult contexts, right? The ways in which people of African descent have chosen kinship language as a way of creating community amidst broad processes of mobility, um, disenfranchisement. Um, so this community is very much a migrant community. We have Afro-Caribbean uh, evangelicals and also highly mobile African-American evangelicals who are part of this uh, faith-based community in Atlanta. And so I argue that Kingcraft also speaks to what I call the semiotic audacity of people of African descent conscripting kinship language, even in times of slavery when they weren't able to own or lay claim to their kin, of making themselves kin um, amidst contexts of disenfranchisement and mobility. So kincraft weds together this evangelical sensibility and this Afro-diasporic um, provenance uh, to really understand and make sense of the kinship claims that Black evangelicals um, are making in real time in their lived religious experience in Atlanta. Oh, wow. Thank you. And you use the phrase um, fictive kinship? I yes. Believe. And it is a way of expressing, I guess, the idea that it's not just blood relationships. Right. Like the normally way we think of kin are their are right. relatives, are blood a, relatives. Exactly, Joe. It's actually a really, it's an older term um, that was really popular within kinship studies. Fictive kinship was understood to be kinship claims that were made that weren't biological, right? The problem with fictive kinship as a term is that it assumes that biological kinship is primary, right, or operative. And what um, we really learned as scholars of kinship is that a lot of kinship studies in anthropology exported Western genealogical sensibilities across the world and was based in a lot of assumptions. So because of that, our understandings of kinship claims that aren't grounded in biology, right, in Western contexts and beyond, sometimes are very impoverished. So I actually rebuke the idea of fictive kinship, right, and try to show how people create discourse, enliven it with their time and their resources and their food sharing and their mentoring yeah, yeah, and yeah, discipling yeah. as well. Right, right. Now, as you say, that word fictive makes it sound like it's make-believe or not real right, right? right. so the, the bias there is sort of built right into the that, that phrase right in a way that you're trying to argue i take it that that's not the case that these are real kinship right uh, right and not uh and not some kind of artificial thing uh, and there's also valences of deception i think that that hang around um, there's a sociologist named margaret nelson who actually has a uh, a book that came out about fictive kinship and one of the things she noticed was that in doing a lit review of social scientific studies of fictive kinship that social scientists themselves are more likely to use the language of fictive kinship when speaking to uh, minoritized populations, right? Okay. Um, uh, there were other terms, chosen kin was used in, in queer communities, 
um, you know, peer networks were used in white communities. So the, the term fictive kinship itself, according to Margaret Nelson, is quite racialized. I remember uh, a comment by a classical kinship theorist, uh, Julian Pitt Rivers, and uh, his quote uh, was, non-kin enmity loves to masquerade as kinship. <laughs> Right, the idea of the masquerade, that somehow there's yeah, yeah, something right. deceptive versus yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What is it when you mean when you call yourself brothers and sisters in Christ? Please explain it to me. What does it mean to you, right? Um, yeah, so yeah. yes, I, I, I'm indebted to anthropology, but also sociologists uh, work on, on that as well. Right, okay, very good. Thank you, Don. Mm -hmm. All right, Tony, let's turn to you. Same, same question. Um, tell us a little bit, and maybe again, kind of tell us a little bit about the prosperity gospel. Um, right, and, and who the prosperity gospel Latinos are, particularly, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, kind of a little overview of what, what you, your research question. Yes, uh, well, so thank you again, thank you, and it's, it's nice to meet you, Todd, <laughs> we've, we've crossed paths in many places, but we never actually met until, until today, until right now. So yeah, Does this because... constitute meeting? <laughs> I guess so. I'm teaching Tony's book in my class this semester, so yes, oh, it does. Great. Yeah, oh. yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's fictive. Maybe maybe it's fictive meeting. <laughs> but so so my book, I, I wanted to to use the, the immigrant experience to shed light into a uh, American phenomenon, right? Which is the prosperity gospel, and of course there there's a full range of prosperity gospels. And uh, from hard prosperity to the more neo Pentecostal, new world soft prosperity. My, my, the people I study are, are more towards the, the more traditional uh, hard prosperity, uh, which, which means they, they, they focus on the material uh, reward of faith, right? The, the, and, and I argue that the, the, the prosperity gospel is the, is the gospel of the American dream. It's, it's the, ideals of, the ideals of meritocracy and, uh, and consumerism spiritualized in a form that, that's attractive to people. And, uh, and it's a, a, a theodicy for, for both the suffering and the, the wealthy, right? For the suffering, it gives them hope to pursue the, that, 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 they, that they can achieve uh, prosperity. For those already prosperous, it gives them, it's a theodicy to justify their, their wealth so that they don't have, they, they, it's not, uh, Weber said it's not, it's not enough to know why one is wealthy. It, the, the wealthy need to know why they are wealthier in comparison to those who are suffering, right, to the poor. And prosperity gospel gives, uh, Gives them that justification, and and it is at the core of the American dream and the whole idea of of meritocracy. And I I, I wanted to to study immigrant communities because they are the, the newest Americans are usually the, the the ones who aspire to the ideals the the best and the hardest. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I I looked at Latin American Spanish speaking immigrant communities and why they were they were adopting this, uh, they were converting. Most of the, the, the Christians I study, they converted to, to this faith. Uh, most of those who are coming right now, no, the, the, from Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, they are already prosperity gospel but believers, right? 90 some percent of the, 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 the people, general population, not even Pentecostals or Christians, but the general population in Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras believe that if you have faith, God will give you you know, wealth and, and health, right? And th those are the people coming who are at the border right now. So those, they're, they're coming already believing in, this, in these ideals. But the ones, the ones I study in my ethnography, they, uh, they did not, they, they converted when they came to, to this country. And, th and that's, that's what I was, well, I was very curious to see why. It clearly wasn't because of the money, right? They, no, not everybody was getting rich, but also, if, uh, if, if you're an immigrant and you're able to make it in, in the U.S. And, and essentially survive for all these years, you, uh, you, you have some, you're pretty smart. You're pretty sophisticated, right? To, to be able to navigate, you know, show up without speaking English, without any connection, and, and you make it, you know, you, right, you right. marry, you have kids, someone to buy houses. You, <laughs> That's you, a lot of merit. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, you're not, you're not, you know, you're not some gullible fool who's been, who's believing in, 
in this pie in the sky, you know, nonsense. So, so why, why, yeah. why, when they're they're so smart and have all these skills and and talents, are they adopting the, this space? And and that's that's uh, that's why the, the the title of the book is, is key, right? You can read the whole whole book by the title of the the cover of the book. Is their American dream, right. right? So they're not they're not coming here just chasing a generic American dream of uh, of uh, you know pick a fence houses and you know two point five kids. They are chasing their version oh, yeah. of the American dream, which is uh, a lot more therapeutic than the material things that that this country. Uh, promises. They know. They know that hard work alone is not going to get them to to where they need to be. But they believe. I, I use the term miraculous meritocracy, uh-huh. right? And prosperity gospel gives them. They'll they'll work hard. They'll have to sacrifice, and both in real life and and in the in spiritually, right, in the church. And the work alone is not going to make it, but the work will get God's attention to give them that miracle that will, that will take them over the, you know, yeah. to, to, to their dream. Yeah. Oh, wow. The, can I just ask, um, sorry, I don't want to get into mm-hmm. the weeds on these things um, a lot of time, but that who it is, is, do you think the prosperity gospel is something that's been exported already? You said that a lot of the people in the, the Central American countries, you mentioned Salvador and so on, already seem to have this idea. Is that is that a form of the prosperity gospel that they actually have? And and how did oh, they yeah. happen? How did they get it? Um, I, 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 from listening to you, it sounded like it's a kind of an American thing. Oh, in, it, US it, by America. So, so towards, towards the end of the book, I, and I didn't get into this too too deeply because I, I didn't do research outside of the US, so I couldn't I couldn't speak with total authority, but I hinted. Right, that that this is um, a, a new form of uh, of a, a spiritualized version of colonialism, right? Of the the same colonialism that that happened before, with this uh, the the neoliberalist capitalist ideals that is that is very Western, you know, embedded in in Western ideals that are being exported via um, a, a, a spiritual uh, a, a, as a spiritual version. And not only is it transforming cultures in other countries, right? Uh, you know, just anecdotally, my my friend who lived in Kenya said they, that it was a national holiday when Juanita Bayun, a prosperity gospel preacher, went there. It was a national holiday, and they shut down the schools, right? And most people here have no Joe. You have no idea who she is, right? Have you ever heard of her, Juanita, Juanita Bayun? <laughs> See, but you have, yeah, probably, <laughs> but it. But in Kenya, they close they close the, the the schools for to welcome a prosperity gospel preacher, right? So so their influence and the the prosperity gospel preachers outside of the U.S. It, they're they their their assistant pastors are wealthier than some of the the prosperity gospel preachers here in the U.S. Right? The yeah. the, the 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 biggest prosperity gospel network of churches in the world. Right, the, the the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God in in Brazil, in São Paulo, Brazil, right? The they're worth billions, right? Whereas the wealthiest prosperity gospel preachers here are, are worth a, a few million. I, I don't think any of them passes even a hundred million. Apparently. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, they, they are. <laughs> yeah, so so it is it is uh, it, it is exported. It is. Uh, Transforming communities in other parts of the world, and it is. I, I think the the more more um, the the more I think uh, we uh, cautious, right? We I don't want to say dangerous, but the, the 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 more concerning part is that it's wiping out local versions of Christianity, so that you can you can go literally. I, I've been to church in in Buenos Aires. And if you close your eyes, it, it feels exactly like any prosperity gospel church here in the U.S., right? They sing the same song. It's the same style, different language, but the core of the message is the same, right? And it wasn't like this. You know, 50 years ago, each country had their own hymns, right? Each country had their, the, the, the essence, the culture of that country was infused into their expression of Christianity. 
but in the last roughly 20, 20 to 30 years, that's the local versions have been wiped away by the, the English speaking version, right? Not just the US, but you know, Australia, Kyosone is it, it, also extremely uh, popular. And, yeah. and then of course, the other unsaid part is that in a lot of places in this country, your ability to speak English is the sign of prosperity. So if you are anywhere in Latin America, Southeast Asia, and throughout the continent of Africa, if you speak English and you can preach in English, you are, people see you right as more more successful. Yeah, right. Okay, let me. I, mm -hmm. I need to. I'll move yep. us along a little bit. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm I'm uh, prone to ask questions, <laughs> more questions than I should. Um, let's go back to you, um, Todney. Um, both of these books are ethnographies, uh, meaning, of course, that the author spent a lot of time in direct interaction with people and churches. And, um, so on that they were studying. And uh, Todney, why don't you begin, tell us a little about your field work, who, who we were working with and where, and then Tony. Sure, um, so I uh, did work in um, two um, Black evangelical congregations in the Atlanta metropolitan area. I spent a, more time at one, which was a predominantly Afro-Caribbean um, evangelical congregation, but I also had some interactions with the sister church um, uh, also in the Atlanta metropolitan area that was um, a predominantly African-American uh, evangelical uh, congregation. So these two congregations came out of the same religious movement um, that was spawned by um, kind of Afro-Caribbean missionary who came to the segregated South in the 1950s uh, to plant um, what uh, uh, they refer to as Bible-believing churches, right? So that the history of this, of this organization, it's not denomination, is, is fascinating, right? Um, you have a, an afro bahamian missionary who's basically deciding to do missionary work in what's what's properly known to as the Bible Belt, right? So there's a lot of variegation within intra-Christian um, uh, uh, identities, intra-Black, intra-racial identities. Um, uh, ethnicity is an important part of the story. Um, I spent um, uh, roughly a year um, in the Atlanta metropolitan area um, getting acclimated into community life. Um, when students ask me, I think there's a, a kind of uh, exotic idea about what field work looks like, uh, especially on the part of some of the Divinity School students that I work with who are interested in ethnographies and methodology. And like, well, what was it like? What were you doing? You know, I was like, I went to a lot of Bible studies. On average, I went to about four um, a week. By and large, that was the most common um, activity uh, that I was um, a part of. Um, but um, ethnography also meant, you know, I was asked to be a vacation Bible school teacher, right? Um, I uh, was part of a, a local cell group, and so that meant hanging out, right? Um, I um, would sometimes be, sometimes we would have a number of services, and there'd be a break between services, so that means sometimes I'd get asked over for dinner in between you know, say worship service, which went from the breaking of bread at eight till worship service till tearing in the parking lot that might end around one or two. So you have like six hours of church, then a break, and then there might be a church anniversary service. You know, so I've had days, um, Sundays that have lasted, um, field work days that have lasted around 14 hours, um, you know, with content, you know, some of the busiest days. Um, you know, so it could be what I also call deep hanging out, right? And so I also talk about um, Marla Frederick is one of my favorite anthropologists. She has this book called Between Sundays, Black Women and Everyday Struggles of Faith. And so Between Sundays Fellowship could mean someone's doing what, what's called in the Caribbean a lime, which is like hanging out. And so uh, one of my church um, parents, uh, uh, she was an amazing cook. And so her house was the house where people sometimes especially Jamaican congregants who wanted to hang out. So one Friday, she might be making goat soup um, and uh, churchmen are playing dominoes in, in the basement, there's gospel. Um, I'm hanging out with her in the kitchen and keeping her company, you know? Um, and so it also meant being a part of these, of these fellowship, these, these informal impromptu fellowship moments as well between Sundays, right? So right. Um, field work required um, attending the, the sort of formal um, institutional services, but you know, uh, I repurposed Rabbitoh's idea of the invisible church, these invisible church quotidian moments as well, right? Church sisters getting together for a prayer service. I grew up Presbyterian, so I thought a prayer service would last 
an hour. <laughs> you know, it's on a Friday night. I'm thinking, okay, it's a Friday night. It's at someone's house. It's going to last an hour. It starts at seven. And then I get home at 3 a.m. <laughs> you, know, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm rabid. I tell, I tell students, you know, one of my biggest uh, advice points to you is pack snacks, right? Pack snacks. You know, when you don't know what fellowship looks like or what it can mean time wise, I've had so many low blood sugar moments. So it became as those relationships of trust and being known, I kind of got adopted by two couples who, who kind of helped me become more fully integrated into this quotidian church. Um, it, it meant going from the institutional to the everyday. And it, it was a process. It took months really before people were interested in really talking to me, right? It was yeah, a lot right. of being the unpopular. I don't know if Tony has the experiences, but being the unpopular kid at school again on purpose, you know, hanging out, kind of getting ignored, feeling awkward. Um, but over time, um, getting more and more integrated. And, and I always say that one of my favorite stories is you can think that you're being innocuous or you're fully integrated. I remember one time there was a vacation Bible school, um, uh, like, you know, FET, you know, people were eating was a, a barbecue. And um, I was hungry. I, was, I just remember being hungry <laughs> didn't feel right. and I was eating a hot dog and I was just minding my own business. I was just taking a beat. Right. And someone walks over to me and says, I bet you're just you're just standing there and you're taking this all in and you're just gonna go home and scribble this in your notebook. <laughs> and and I said, you know, Brother Johnson, I'm just right now, I'm just eating a hot dog. But it was a reminder because I'd been there about for about eight months at that point. Some people never forget, you know, why you're there. Right. right. Uh, even if you're you're if you get integrated enough to be, you know, to be trusted with someone's children as a teacher is a big act of trust, but there are people who still remember um, why you're there, right? What, what you're doing when you're there. And even when you are trying to check out, they haven't deselected or forgotten um, the work that you're doing. So that's a bit about um, yeah, what that yeah, was like. Lots good. of Bible studies. Yeah, and did you, um, you know, often, I have, a, I have an undergraduate degree in anthropology. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, in those days, it seemed like everybody had to go outside the an, an anthropologist yeah. staying inside the United States was like mm -hmm. not not what people did but I were there certain um, kind of confidants or or what's the usual word they speak of you know kind of a yeah somebody who kind of helps you understand the culture so, you know a kind of an interpreter if you will um, were there certain people like that that you yeah. were able to kind of I, have a close absolutely. relationship with? Absolutely. So there were sort of two couples that adopted me. Um, one was a Jamaican, Afro-Jamaican couple. One was an Afro-Trinidadian and African-American couple. Um, so there were like, they were the places where I could go in between church or I could just show up or, you know, and it was really came out of the sensibility that like a young single woman shouldn't be in a city without people. It was really, I think, a kind of migrant sensibility and Afro-Diasporic ontology, which is very heavily relational. The idea like yeah. Part of the reason why people get adopted or make kin is because it's understood to be, I mean, and I guess I was a migrant in a sense, right? To be in a new place without people is dangerous, right? Like that's, it's not okay for someone to be without people. So my, one of my uh, church parents, my Afro and daddy and father called me a stray alley cat. <laughs> he was like, you know, stray alley cat, you feed it and it keeps coming back to your house. You know, who's explaining to someone else how he knew me? She's like, you know, she's our daughter, yeah. she's right. a stray alley cat that we took in. Um, so they were very helpful, especially when I would sometimes run against, you know, my, my grad advisor Susie would be like, you're the instrument. So your faux pas, your mistakes, all of that are how you learn. And so, you know, at one point I remember sitting between my church parents and I was told that it was inappropriate to sit between a husband and wife in church. And so they were where I could go to process, you know, things like that. Like, did I, I'm sorry if I messed up. They thought it was ridiculous, but they could, they explained to me what the rationale was, you know, and they were like, they obviously don't get that we're kin, but this is what they meant when they said that, you know, um, there was also another key informant who was um, an Afro-Jamaican woman who grew up in the States mostly, who was around my age. And so she helped me understand a lot how younger Black evangelicals uh, navigated being within this community, some of their disciplines affection, some of the youth perspectives, some of the, the class, you know, we would hang out like on the weekends too. Um, and it, it was just the kind of hangout that felt less top down and more lateral and peer based. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'd, I'd say there are definitely about five people that really helped me understand 
um, just what some of the, the invisible rules and codes are. If I messed up or got some like sort of negative feedback, I could go to them and say like, how did I mess up? What am I missing? And they could translate for me. Um, and yeah, I think that the point about what is, what is real ethnography? Does it take place outside of the United States? And I still think that that's, um, you know, I still think that's a thing, Joe, right? Um, I have been lucky. I went to Cornell undergrad. Vilma Santiago Irizarry was my advisor, Puerto Rican anthropologist who did work in the US. Um, and I, I never got any discourage, uh, discouragement from the program at, at um, UVA for wanting to do domestic research. For me, anthropology <laughs> has such a colonial legacy. Um, and even in my newest work on contemporary Black church arts, and we have so much stuff we have to unpack here. Um, that the idea for me of going somewhere else, we have so many colonialities and <laughs> antis and isms uh, mm -hmm. bubbling up here. I could spend my life very comfortably doing work in the US and, and always, I think, be engaged. But I think that's still, uh, for some, a very operative uh, uh, idea. And I've been grateful because I think religious studies has been a great home for my work and understanding the, the significance of study something as mundane as evangelicalism that's not cool or <laughs> right it, so from a certain standpoint and religious studies is all your job is to make it is that so it. significant you know yeah <laughs> all right uh tony same same question tell us a little bit about your uh yeah kind so, of you did your field work and so your... this this whole project it, it stems out of a, a class an ethnography class i was taking ethnography with with Sharon Hayes. Remember Sharon when she was at UVA? Yeah. <laughs> so she was teaching ethnography and I was taking her class and she said one of the assignments was you have to go somewhere you've never been, right? It has to be somewhere new. And I too grew up Presbyterian, still am Presbyterian. <laughs> so I thought, what is the most different from Presbyterianism? Pentecostalism. And I was just looking for a straight up Pentecostal church. I had, I had visited some friends Pentecostal church so I knew it was different enough, but I didn't, you know, certainly never study. Or, or, um, or participated deeply in those communities. Mm -hmm. And so I, it was in Charlottesville. I went to, to the, the first one that, that was close and convenient. I, I showed up and on that Sunday, the, the preacher said, anybody who brings a hundred dollars will get 10,000 by the end of the year. And I had never been in a context like that. And I had certainly never been in a context where people went up and gave him the money. <laughs> So, so as a good ethnographer, objective scholar, I said, well, let me hang around to see if this works. Cause you know, I, I bring no judgment, right? And so I, I stuck around and that he became, he started this fascinating, you know, adventure. It's, uh, it was a Spanish speaking church. I'm, I'm from Argentina and the, the most, uh, at, at that time, the most famous Pentecostal, Spanish speaking Pentecostal preacher, right? Claudio Frazon is, is from Buenos Aires. So, so it was, uh, it, it resonated, it made sense, right? That somebody from, from Argentina would show up to, to one of these churches. And the, the church was so fluid. And most of these communities are, are very fluid. So it's a new person, it's not, uh, it, it doesn't raise any eyebrows. It's not like your, your country church, right? Where people have their own cues and <laughs> generations sit there, right? It's, it's so fluid that they don't, they, they, they didn't mind. They were very open to, to helping me interview the pastor was very open he was you know helping helping identify people i could interview and then i went to san diego so it was charlottesville and the church i studied in charlottesville is no longer there so i can say charlottesville there they're, they've moved uh and the pastor has has moved on to, to a different city but and, and and then i went to san diego for uh, for a few months to do an ethnography there and and then uh, after so so my during the, as a graduate student, I, on, I only did those two cities. And then as a postdoc, you, Joe, gave me money to do New York City. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you funded. I'm a fault. <laughs> yes. The, the Institute gave me money to, to research New York City. So, so I had Charlottesville where, where immigrants who have been here between 10 and 15 years. San Diego was very transient. Most of the people were, the, the pastors have been there a little bit longer than, you know, about 10 years or so, but they didn't, the, even the pastors didn't speak English fluently in, in San Diego. And most of the people, because it was so transient, most of the people did not, uh, were, were not fluent in, in English. And, and many of the cars in the parking lot there had Mexican plates, right? It was, they, 
they just came came back and forth. And then the the New York City one, it was it was here in Manhattan, and that church is also no longer there. But it was mostly the, uh, Puerto Ricans and uh, Dominicans who had been here for a long time, and their immigration status is obviously very different from those I, I studied. So I wanted a, a, a comparison to see. How, how does prosperity gospel play out for for immigrant communities who have been here, who you know, like the ones in Charlottesville who've been here, they've they're, they're established, they have careers and professions. How 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 what does this mean for them? What does this mean for those who are who are transient, who are not permanent in the U.S. but are coming here for church, seasonal work, right? And then what does it mean for for those who are mostly senior citizens who? who are, uh, many of them were US citizens, right? You know, they're Puerto Rican and Dominicans. They've been here for many decades. Most of them could speak English, but they chose to worship in a Spanish speaking church. Uh, and, and yeah, so, so it was to see the, the way that those three different communities um, practiced and adopted this, uh, the, no, the prosperity no, gospel. Yeah, Tony, I, mm -hmm. you've, you've raised a couple of interesting questions we've got to get to the bottom of. Mm -hmm. I have one, and then Faith has written in one. First, did you go up with $100 and then <laughs> at the service in which you get the 10000 And then did people get the 10000 you, you, <laughs> you got us hanging now. <laughs> right. You plant your seed. <laughs> yeah. I, I was a grad student you know, in those days. I didn't, I didn't roll like that. <laughs> uh, no, I did not go up with uh, $100. I did write down the name of many of the people who went up with the, the hundred dollars and the ones I was able to follow up at the end of the year, they did not uh, get $10,000 in cash. Some said that they were blessed in other ways, you know, different jobs or more work. Uh, and m many of them, it was self blame They, they sabotage their, uh, their own prosperity somehow. Right, so, so as I said in, in the earlier on in the book, the, the, the prosperity gospel is a is formulaic, right? It's a it's a very modern religion, right? That that follows a, a prescription, a, a, a formula to, that to them is scientific. It, it cannot fail, right? It's like a science. Faith plus action equals blessing. So if you have enough faith, which includes positive thinking, right? If you have faith and you take action, which means which the more sacrificial the action right the more likely god is going to pay attention to you but you have to take a step of faith you have to put that money the money you don't have in the offering plate you have to you know uh, buy the car or the house you can't afford right in faith that god will give you the money you have to do something and if you have faith and you 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 take action god will bless you but those faith and action are so subjective that if you don't get it it's it's so easy to say that you know the, I have said up to this point and I doubt it and that's how it touches, right? Or I didn't, I didn't sacrifice it. I missed a tithe, right? I missed paying a tithe and that's why. So if I do it again, right? And, and this is ultimately the reason why, why prosperity gospel is so powerful, right? Is, um, is, is that it, it, it keeps them hoping, right? It keeps them hoping and, and, and pushing for, uh, to, to achieve that dream. And, and to, to those who criticize, Th those who believe this, I often ask, what, what hope can you give, give them, right? If you don't, if you don't believe this, right? To to these people who've already suffered so much and risked everything and even their lives to come here and try to make it, and they have this dream that, in our logic, in our Western <laughs> logic, in our ivory tower, they they are not going to be able to make it. But, you know, how how do we make that? Makes sense to those who suffer so much, right? Yeah, very good. Uh, uh, okay, let me come back to you, uh, Todney. Um, you both, you both, I guess, have already sort of said personal things, but um, both of these seem kind of like personal. There's a personal element in these projects, and I wonder if you could just briefly elaborate, if you if you care to, um, on 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 kind of you know, a little bit of how you came to these particular topics um, in your own, if there's a biographical component. Yeah, go ahead, Todd. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, 
that's actually a very great question, Joe. Um, and and there's a way in which um, I was actually challenged by a divinity school student here um, a couple years ago. Um, uh, so there's sort of two things that I think are really personal about this project, um, and, and it's written into the the final sort of the final book project. I decided to err on the side of being more vulnerable about my own family background because family can be very deeply intimate and personal. So even as I'm studying the spiritual kinship stuff, I'm also dealing with some of the ways in which Black families have been pathologized, right? Um, particularly in a post-Moynihan report, some of the same stuff happens in the Caribbean as well for whether they're able to approximate, you know, heteronormative relationships or not. So I end the book by talking about my divorce and how my spiritual parents responded to that. Um, and interestingly, like throughout the course of my field work, I got engaged while I was doing field work. <laughs> People from church were at my wedding. Um, and even though I was making this argument that, you know, we have to pay attention to this spiritual kinship that, that even Black evangelicals are constructing, we miss the boat when we think that neo-evangelicalism is inherently about heteropatriarchal family values, right? That, that there's something else that's going on. Even though I was writing this argument, I withheld my family information from my, my church parents because I expected them to judge me. And then when I told them, about what happened, they didn't. <laughs> and so that's how I knew my argument was right. But I also talked about what does it mean that the problem that I was writing against, I fell into as a researcher, right? That I was writing against this problem, but I replicated it in the ways that I related to, to people who adopted me and made me kin, right? People who had shared some really painful aspects about their family life. And, you know, I mean, I've had interviews where people were in tears, right? And I withheld my family information. I compartmentalized uh, my, my heteronormative failures or whatever, even though I was talking about how spiritual kinship kind of tries to open up those compartments. But the second thing is um, uh, the student child, I had a conversation um, for theories and methods here and students were asking about ethnography. And one of the things I love about the Divinity School is that we have students from so many different backgrounds. Um, and so one student said, you know, um, what do you think are the politics of you being like a liberal humanist doing research with conservative communities that you have no personal grounding in? And I had to respond to the student, what makes you think I have no personal grounding with evangelicalism? And one of the things I forgot to mention, I had to go back to my introduction. I don't even, I think maybe Susie knew this, but I went to an evangelical primary school from ages five to 13. It was um, a school that was sponsored by uh, the Southern Baptist Convention. Some of our textbooks were created by Bob Jones University. Um, and then I grew up in a black Presbyterian church. And so my own childhood straddled these two religious worlds. I remember uh, when I would be presented with forms of Christianity that didn't make sense with my home Christianity. And my mom would be like, ah, that's, that's their stuff over there, right? And we do something different. Don't pay that any money. Like there was, it was this idea that somehow these Christianities were irreconcilable and evangelicalism was somehow for white people. It wasn't for me as a black person. And so it also helped me think through why people have such a hard time, even scholars conceiving of black evangelicals, right? So one of the things that I, I noticed is that even for scholars of evangelicalism, I get questions that are kind of like, how evangelical are they? Right. Or I remember giving a presentation once and Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright was in the audience and he was like, who are these people? Like, it's like they're the wrong kind of black people or we don't know how, how evangelical are they really? And um, I realized that part of the reason that annoyed me, even though I wasn't aware of until a student pushed me, was that I'd actually grown up around some fault lines and had to try and navigate these two religious worlds as, as a child. I don't know if I ever actually really did, um, but ended up, I don't know, maybe somehow we're always working out some childhood issue, sometimes if they're research, whether they're aware of it or not, um, but it was actually a student challenging me. And when I explained that I was part of this evangelicalism, I was the captain of the Bible quiz team. Um, one of the reasons why um, uh, someone told me, I didn't know if you were a Christian, but you know, you knew the word, you knew the Bible so well, like you had scripture memorized and I saw your Bible was marked up. And this was like my Bible from school, right? 
um, that I had an evangelical background. So a lot of people think, oh, you're black. And so you're doing research with black people and that gets you entry. It was the fact that I was properly biblical, according to someone that made them trust me. Right. So those are some of the, the personal aspects of, of, yeah. of the story. You know, uh, uh, Holly, uh, one of our uh, participant asked if um, the question of whether the ethnography changed you doing, you know, doing the ethnography. Mm -hmm. Would you just have a brief response to that? I would actually. Um, I think the ethnography changed me in the sense that it, it created what I like to call epistemological humility. I think realizing that I've been working on this problem, right? And one of the problems I write against is that sometimes we tend to essentialize conservative religious movements in the same way as since we essentialize race. We think we know what a community is because we have these racial and religious cartographies in our minds. So, so black evangelicals are either the wrong kind of black people or they're not quite evangelical. They're kind of these token minorities. Um, and, and my own research questions that, or evangelicals are really engaged in a spiritual project, but sometimes we still fall into that biological issue. Even though I was like, fifth of kinship is crap. And <laughs> I still fell into the problems that I was trying to, to write against. Right. Um, and so I think I end the conclusion by talking about, hey, reader, I've tried to teach you a thing. Right. Um, but I want you to know that. Right. Um, I also learned from my mistakes that the problem I'm writing about, I fell into and I fell into after having evidence to the contrary. Um, I think also I've tried to learn, even as I'm doing research in a community that has a different gender politics than me, um, I won't say it has a different civic politics because I did research in an election year and some people were voting for Barack Obama and some people weren't. So I don't think we can say that evangelical always means Republican. My, my uh, research very much challenges that. Um, but that really, uh, there was actually a, a poem by Elizabeth Alexander that helped me come up with the idea of kincraft. And she talks about poets and why she loves poets. And she says she has a veneration for the sweat of the craft that really after becoming married and divorced and becoming a parent, the labor that goes into making family, right? Um, you know, I remember going back to interviews after becoming a parent and I heard things that I didn't hear when I was in grad school. I'm like, oh, that's anxiety, right? Um, and so it did change me. I think it made me more humanistically oriented, more inclined to have a respect for the project, even though it's not my project, it's not my gender politics, but, making family, making kinship, keeping your families afloat, being a part of religious community takes an inordinate amount of time and commitment and labor and energy. And I respect the labor, even if the politics are not my politics. And I think that that changed me. I think it made me more of a humanistic scholar and I think a better citizen in some ways, right? And, th and this is not to obviate, evangelicalism is exceptionally <laughs> problematic. It propagates a number of violences. But I think it taught me a certain kind of analytical and civic neighborliness that I try to tap into that I think our country could very much benefit from okay. in this moment. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I realize we're, we're, we're running out of time, but let me, uh, Tony, I'm going to ask you the, the same question and just in terms of your own personal experience and how that played into uh, mm -hmm. how this unfolded for you. And maybe even the same question about whether um, there was... Um, you know, that doing it, it, it changed you in any way. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And, and thank you, Tony, for, I, I was going to mention when Joe asked a question about the, the, your conclusion in that book, when I got there and, and read that conversation, I mean, everybody should read her book. <laughs> when I read that phone conversation included, I he was like, oh, wow. <laughs> so everybody read her book. Um, so for me, it was, I think I, I was very curious as, you know, as, as a Presbyterian and a Presbyterian minister, right? I'm, I'm ordained in a Presbyterian church. I, I serve an immigrant church, Taiwanese, Taiwanese American immigrant church. I was always very curious about the, the uses of religion in, to immigrant communities. And, and that's why I think I was attracted to, to these communities and why I, I asked the questions I did. The, the, the way that it changed me, I think, I think two, two ways. One was uh, being, being Presbyterian, I, and of course now, you know, a, a scholar, right? I, I tend to live in my head, right? Presbyterianism, we, we worship with our minds. 
and Pentecostals worship with their mind and their bodies, right? They, I don't want to say just their body, but they, they, you know, they worship with both. I only worship with one. And being with them taught me that, that, that there, there are aspects of worship that, uh, that I was missing, right? I, I, I was missing an aspect of worship when I didn't worship with my body. I recognize what's missing. I still don't worship with, I'm still Presbyterian. I still don't put my hands up when I worship. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I recognize- You didn't go that far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey, let's not, let's not take it that far, okay? But, <laughs> yeah, <that's a> <laughs> but I think, but that made me think of what else, right? What else am I missing that, that I'm not using, where, where my body is not partaking, right? So, you know, you know, because they have a, not, not only do they worship with their bodies, right? They're faithful with their bodies. They are gracious, right? They extend mercy with their bodies. And those are all the things that I was not physically, uh, I didn't know that was possible until I, I, I was immersed in these communities. And then the, the other part, the, way, the other way to change me is, is because of what I learned, it, it, it humbled me theologically, right? I, I was one of those and people who've known me before who know me in all my life, I used to be the, you know, the, the intolerant, uh, you know, Presbyterian, uh, you know, if you're not Presbyterian, you don't know what's going on right? <laughs> type of guy. But it, it's clearly, it, it, it forced me to recognize that Presbyterianism is a theology for the, for the privilege, right? It's a, it's a, it's a theology of the, of, of people who, who, who have been uh, privileged with a certain type of life. And, uh, and it, there, there's little use. I will even go that far to say there's little use for, for Presbyterian theology, from my perspective, for, for people who've, who've gone through, through serious cha challenges and, and trauma. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's go back to Todney again. Um, and uh, uh, I want to just ask, um, and again, I have to keep it to a short because we're running out of time. Um, if one reads this book, what do you want the reader to take away? Like what, what if, you, if you could distill it down to you, kind of the, 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 the most important message you think you have tried to convey in the book and through your research and through the ethnography, um, you know, what, what, would that, what would that be? This is another way of saying, why should they read your book? <laughs> right. I, think that's, I love these questions, though. They're so practical, but they're also um, they're challenging in, in a good, good way, all the, good, all the best ways. Um, I think the answer to that is really um, a coda at the end of my book. Um, and so um, I finished this book as the COVID-19 pandemic um, pretty much started, right? And, um, you know, I was talking to some friends, and I said, I want to really kind of mention like um how right into this moment and, and like what work with black evangelicals and thinking about really religion as a vector for kin making right like rather than thinking about religion just as worship or you know thinking about what religion offers all of us when we think about it as a site where people make collectivity and um you know i end the book by talking about you know what it what it meant to kind of be watching the news and to think about sort of the, the nuclear family model and the toilet paper hoarding and this idea of, of of nuclear stand apart as isolation and and that what i hope is that this book does is that it shows these other ways of being in community right these kind of lateral networks um these sometimes where people rebuke the nuclear right um in, in, in favor of different forms of, of sociality, um, different forms of reciprocity, uh, that there are really, even as mutual aid has become a catchphrase, right? That there are modes of collectivity and kin making um, that have pre-existed this moment that can help us inhabit this moment in a way that can contribute to our mutual survival. And so I end the book kind of by asking people to think about their own kin making practices, right? Like who's your family, right? And how do you know, right? And, and, and how might those definitions be productively stretched or challenged or relativized or thought through, right? Um, who's not a part of that family who maybe needs to be, right? Um, 
uh, how are our definitions of kinship expansive and limiting? What new horizons might this moment uh, and might this book inspire us to to sort of think about and think through and and improvise or 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 um, innovate? Um, and so that's why I, I want people to not just get a story of a really committed and beautiful um, and challenging and contentious community, right? Um, it's it's not it's not just a romance. It's 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 a real study. Um, but also for people to start asking those questions about their own socialities and, and kin making, right? Um, and I, I think it's time. And for me, the pandemic, just seeing what people were doing with resources and 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 how people thought about survival, the times in which people entrenched and looked inward versus, you know, friends of mine who were organizers. Um, I have a friend who's a community organizer who enlisted me and some of her friends to help deliver food to undocumented workers who aren't included in the unemployment numbers in our country because they're undocumented. And so when the restaurant industry tanked, we had food insecurity went way up, but there are people who aren't being counted, right? So does your sense of kinship or community leave space for this kind of mutual aid? Or are you trying to hoard toilet paper in your individual house, right? <laughs> so that 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 to me is- is Not guilty. <laughs> Um, Tony, we're, we, it's 2.57, so um, mm -hmm. can you just uh, yeah, I, the, the short goal, version of the takeaway? The, the goal of my book was to offer a little window into, uh, ultimately, it, in, into the essence of Americanism, right? What, it, what is it to, to be American? And I, I wanted to show, show us what it, what it meant American through the window of this uh, Latin American immigrants. And like I said, prosperity gospel is the gospel of the American dream. And I think I, uh, at every level, all of us, all of us, whether you're Christian or not, right, in any, whether you're, you're religious or not, if you, if you live in this country, in the, in the system that we live in, we, we all believe in some level, at some level, we believe this. And it helps explain what happened in the last four years, why some of the most prominent preachers you've seen in the last four years who gathered around Trump were prosperity gospel preachers, right? That, that, uh, that it's, not, it's not an, uh, an aberration of what this country aspired to, but it is uh, almost the logical conclusion of where, well, no conclusion, right? It's still, it's still going on of, of what happens. Right when you have a culture that that's so embedded into these these ideals, and and I I hope my book through this small segment of the community helps to to share some light into that. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, thank you. It, it is time for us to wrap up. Uh, thanks to Tony and to Todney and everyone who is watching. Uh, please consider buying Prosperity Gospel Latinos and Their American Dream, Tony's book, and Kincraft: The Making of Black Evangelical sociality from your local independent bookstore or through the links on vabook.org. Uh, you can also check out other events in the all virtual Virginia Festival of the Book uh, at vabook.org. Uh, so thank, thank you all. This is a really wonderful conversation and the really terrific books and we really thank you for writing them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for hosting this show. Tony, well, it's nice to meet you. I hope we can collaborate. I didn't know you yeah. had a Presbyterian yeah. background. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll touch base. Let's, yeah. Let's, I love let's, that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do things in person next time. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you okay. all. Yep. Yeah.